Ah, here, here. I think we're here now. Hello? Hello, yes. Ah, you can hear me, Dan. Yes. Good, good. Sorry about that. I, I think there's something wrong with my phone. I'm not very good with these mobile phone things. Sorry about that. Right. Sorry. Yeah, I'm noticing that on WhatsApp. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, I'm noticing that on WhatsApp. I've heard of it. I haven't a clue what it is. All right. <laughs> I searched to see if I could see you. Sorry, you're breaking up? Oh, can you hear me? I searched to see if I could see your pitch. Oh, I'm not doing very well here, are we? No, no. Um, uh, signal's only two out of five at mine. Mine's not too bad. Okay. Um, maybe if we speak slowly... Um, can you hear me, Dan? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Right. Um, thank you. Um, I've been looking at the Red Revelation book. I'm a bit puzzled about several things in the yeah. Revelation, the Grand Climax, its Grand Climax at hand. Um, page 184, for instance, it talks about the date 1919. Yeah. Um, I think I understand how the date is calculated, but, well, I, I don't see a lot of evidence for it. I find that a little bit difficult. That's the first thing. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm listening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the second thing is that um, 42 months or 1,260 days after 1919, when the Watchtower leaders came out of prison in March 1919, and the book states that Jesus chose the Watchtower Society, you have the first of seven seven trumpets of the book of revelation when you had seven district conventions in the 1920s starting in 1922 at cedar point convention and then finishing in 1928 in detroit michigan with the detroit convention um i find it why do you claim that the seven trumpets of the book of revelation was fulfilled in the 1920s in your district conventions and the third thing would be page 253, 254, around there. It talks about the United Nations being a sort of satanic wild beast. Um, so uh, it talks about, for instance, um, page 254, paragraph 10. Notice that the scarlet cow coloured wild beast is also an eighth king. Thus, the United Nations today is designed to look like a world government. And it talks about the United Nations basically being one of these satanic wild beasts from the book of Revelation. So those are the three things, basically, Dan. And thank you. Th thank you for your time. That's all right. That's all right. Can I ask you a few questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, can I ask why you're asking? Well, I'm reading the Revelation it's Grand Climax book. I got literature from the carts and they told me to go to jw.org. And I'm very interested in last day's things or eschatology as, as it's properly turned. So I, I've been going through the book and I've just found it interesting. Can I ask you what um, your religion is? I don't attend any church. I used to be a Baptist. I gave up 10 years ago. Before the Baptist, I was involved with the Pentecostals. Um, but I came to the conclusion it was a giant con. Most people don't take it seriously. Um, there were lots of sexual like... there were lots of sexual scandals in the church. I was told yeah. repeatedly that Jesus was God the Father, um, which is not the Trinity. That's modalism, and I, I got sick of hearing church leaders telling me Jesus was God the Father. If that's the state of the church, I just didn't didn't need it. Um, you can't dialogue or talk to these people. You can't correct these people. Um, so I decided so the best I, thing was to leave. So have you had um, contact with Jehovah's Witnesses in the past? Um, I did look at the b yellow What Does the Bible Really Teach book about 10 years ago, and there was a Jehovah's Witness who came to my house. But after about four meetings, when we dealt with the Trinity, because I believe in the Trinity, he didn't want to talk to me anymore after that. So I got as far as chapter four. I think we did one chapter a week. That was about 10, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so wh where are you? 
where do you live? Oh, I'm not willing to have people come to my house. I've been treated in such a, a bullying way by evangelical Christians. I no longer go to any fellowship. I refuse to put my foot through the door of any meeting place. I will talk to people and I will read literature and I will dialogue because that's how you learn. Um, yeah. But I came to the conclusion it was a waste of time attending meetings um, because you go to these churches and nobody, nobody talks to you. After the service, the men talk about Manchester United or Arsenal or Liverpool or some other soccer team or some, some movie. Uh, the women talk about clothes and shoes, but no one will talk about the Bible. And you're just seen as odd if you want to discuss scripture. There's, there's, just, there's just no interest. Um, so, so have you been to a kingdom hall? Um, the one who visited me about 10 years ago, he invited me to a Kingdom Hall in Devon. And I went to a Kingdom Hall in Devon once, yes. How, how did you find that? Well, I, I'm just the same as everyone else, really. I'm not really, I'm not really interested. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested in the Bible. I'm not interested in attending meetings. May, may, may I make that clear? I, yeah, I, yeah, I, well, I, I don't see any connection between the two. Yeah. So, uh, by so, so you, you 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 can't live in Falmouth. So why can I ask why you only rang the Falmouth Kingdom Hall? I travel around a little bit and I speak to people. Um, you know, if I meet people, I'll, I'll talk to people. I've talked to a few Jehovah's Witnesses all over Cornwall as I've travelled around. Um, so you know that's why I just rang the hall. I did try ringing one or two other halls and I couldn't get through. There was no, no message machine. So I just so, wanted to know yeah. about the 1919 date, the seven yeah. trumpets of the book of Revelation and the UN. And I, I, I tried calling, I think St. Austell was one I tried to call and there was just, the, the machine talked to you and it gave you meeting times, but there was no way well, of leaving a message. Answer. Yeah. That's the answer, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sure yes. you can understand my, my being cautious because, um, I mean, uh, Jesus at, at times um, was asked questions and he was cautious with his responses. He was dependent upon a person's motive as to why, whether Jesus responded. You know that, don't you? you know, yes. You know, the, the example where they were asking... Um, by whose authority do you do this? And do you remember his response? Mm -hmm. Do you remember his response? Or? Yes, um, yes. Because he, he said, well, can I just ask you a question first? <laughs> and he, he threw it back and, and said, uh, which, was, which was it? Um, yeah, could could you, back, you speak back. a little more slowly, Dan, because it's very hard to hear you? Perhaps if we okay. speak a bit slowly, I, I do find it's a, a bit of a bad connection. Speaker, if that's any better. Is, is that any better for you? Yes, yes, thank you, yes. Yeah, yeah and uh, Jesus said to the, uh, to the leaders that asked him, um, can I just ask you a question? Um, the baptism of John, which do you think it was from God or from men? And uh, do you remember their response? Yes, yes. What was that? Um, they said, we're not going to tell you. And yes, unless you answer your question first. Yeah. And do and you remember why they didn't want to say? Because, because they got an ulterior motive, haven't they? They got a reason for asking. They didn't actually believe in Jesus. And they were wanting to discredit him. And so he saw through uh, the motive. So... so there's a reason, I, I, I feel the reason for caution. I'm happy to meet up with you yeah. uh, personally and discuss this, these, these different questions. But, but to have a conversation on the phone with somebody I don't know the surname of, I don't know where you live. My name is Skinner. Name. My name is Robert Skinner. And where are you from? Plymouth. Plymouth, yeah. And to, to, to have a conversation, you know, I, I, I've... I'm not sure of your motive to what purpose you what, what purpose would you explain as to why you're asking us these asking me these specific questions? 
<laughs> Mate, I've got literature from your carts. The people at the carts couldn't answer questions. I've traveled around quite a bit and I've spoken to quite a lot of different people over the last couple of years. Um, they told me to go to jw.org. All the answers are on jw.org, so I've done that. Um, in fact, I was in the library on jw.org when you texted me and told me to come home for 3.30. I'm, I'm home now because I can't, I can't use the phone in the library. So um, all I'm doing is I'm trying to look at your literature. I'm not like the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees. I haven't got um, wicked motives. I'm, I'm asking you questions about your literature. What's wrong yeah. about that? <laughs> How can that be an ulterior motive? I mean, this book, Revelation, its grand climax at hand, is it your literature? Oh, yes, yes. Right, well, I've, got, I've, got, I've been reading it on jw.org and I've got questions. That's, I mean, what's, what's an ulterior motive about that? Um, well, no, I'm saying I'm assess I've got to assess that, haven't I, because you, you phoned out the blue. So I'm, okay. we, 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 um, we live in a location, we are, we stand, as you, as you say, we stand in the street and we, we represent Jehovah's Witnesses. So we, <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we are of the community, live in the community, known in the community. I, I don't know you, you see. So to, to ask some very deep uh, technical question like this, I'm, I'm more interested in what you believe. So you believe in the Trinity, you say? Um, yes, I, I, I was told repeatedly in the in my previous church background that Jesus was the Father, and that's one reason, amongst many reasons, why I left the church. I felt very strongly that that was in error. But you still believe in the Trinity that Jesus is God? Jesus is not the Father. He's the Son of the Father, Second John 3. He's not the Father. That's modalism. But I was told yeah. repeatedly by Pentecostal and Baptist church leaders that Jesus was the father and I, I decided I was wasting my time. I, you know, that's clearly wrong. Jesus is not the father. So I left. Yeah. So Jesus is the son of God. So d does that mean he is still part of the Trinity? The Trinity doesn't have parts. Is he a Trinity? No, no. Is he God? He's, he's Yahweh. The word God wouldn't really mean anything in Jesus's day um, because there were lots of different people who held to different religions. There were the Greeks who held to Zeus and Venus and Jupiter. There was um, the Romans with their gods. There were the Egyptians with Isis and Seb and, and their Egyptian gods. So if you said to someone, do you believe in God? Everyone would say, yeah, I believe in God. But their definitions of God will be totally different. So in the New Testament, the true God of the Bible is identified as Yahweh. The one God who appeared to Moses by the burning bush, Exodus 3, 14, I am that I am in the Old Testament. Yeah. So, so is Jesus Yahweh? Yeah, I've just I've just said that he's he's fully, eternally, completely Yahweh God. He shares his father's nature. He's not the father. He's the son of the father, second John three, but he eternally and completely shares his father's nature. Hebrews one three would go into that. It uses the illustration of a, um, a stamp or a seal that you put in hot wax. And when you put a stone seal or a metal seal into hot wax, you have a perfect image of the seal in the wax. And, and um, the, the Greek, I, I'm not a Greek scholar, obviously, I'm just an ordinary person. But what I've read of the Greek scholars, hypostasis te character, means that, the, the, that, that Christ is the very same, the exact substance of the Father. He, he's not a similar substance to the Father or a lesser substance to the Father. He eternally and completely shares his Father's nature. So Christ is fully Yahweh God, and he's also a man. He, he, two, 2,000 years ago, a human, a human body was made for Jesus Christ. Yeah. So do you know what Jehovah's Witnesses believe? As far as I that, know, that, sorry, I interrupted yeah, you, Dan, sorry. Is it Dan that, or Daniel? Yeah, that, well, I don't know. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Um, as far as I know from the reading I've done, you believe that Jesus Christ, you, you teach to a form of Arianism. You teach that Jesus Christ um, is not the same substance as the Father. He's a lesser substance than the Father. And I think, unless I've got it wrong, you actually believe he's the Archangel Michael. Yeah, another term for him. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so we, so our starting point is quite different, isn't it, really? Well, that's life, isn't it? I mean, yeah. isn't, isn't that the way life is? I mean, you know, some people, um, you know, some people are Muslims, some people are atheists, some people are Methodists. When it comes to sport, some people support Manchester United, others support Arsenal. Others support Barcelona, others support Real Madrid. It's just human nature. People are all different. Everyone starts from a different position because we're different human beings. It's axiomatic, isn't it? That we're going to be different. Yeah. I mean, you know, unless yeah. you are a, 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 a carbon copy clone of me, you're going to be different to me. That's, that's life, isn't it? Well, um, we're talking about scriptural truth, not, not when, what football teams. And um, scriptural truth. Jesus said um, that the truth will set you free. I believe the scriptures have truth in them that we search when we're honest heart and we search the scriptures and find scriptural truth. So that's that's why I asked you about your belief about God because I think that's the most fundamental question. The, your other questions are very are very technical um, and um, um more interested really in your like, like you've explained how, how you believe and we, we're quite fundamentally different then on our belief in that yeah well i thought that was what your statement was you said we're starting from different positions yeah and obviously as i've never been a jehovah's witness and you presumably have never been a baptist or a pentecostalist then we're gonna obviously it's axiomatic it's self-evident truth we're starting from different positions. Just as people yeah. who grow up in Madrid support Real Madrid football team or Atletico Madrid football team, and people who grow up in Manchester support Manchester United or Manchester City, it's not some sort of crime, it's just the way people are. And some people are, support the Conservative Party, other people support the Labour Party, other people don't like either of them, they support the Liberal Democrats. And in Scotland, some people support the Scottish National Party. It's not a crime. It's just the way people are. People are different and they see things differently. You, you can't expect everyone to be exactly like you and see it as some sort of crime. You know, how, how, how dare you? How dare you not think exactly the way I think? Because that's, that's the way people are in life. If you go through life, you find that in life, there's far more people who disagree with you on things than there are people who agree with you on things. That's, that's the way life is. And I use the illustration of sport and politics, different political parties and different soccer teams to just illustrate the fact that people start from different positions. Little boys who grew up in Madrid grew up supporting Atletico Madrid or Real Madrid. And little boys who grew up in Manchester grew up supporting Manchester City or Manchester United. It's not a crime. It's, it's just human nature in the same way that some people grow up as Methodists and other people grow up as Anglicans and some are Mormons. In fact, I'm seeing the Mormons tomorrow um, in, in the library, I'm meeting them in the library tomorrow. And other people are Jehovah's Witnesses and other people are Baptists. That's just the way life is. If you can't see that and you say, oh, there's something wrong with you because we're starting from different positions. How odd. You know, you, you're not exactly the same as me. Then I'd say you don't have a good grasp on reality because reality is people always start from different positions. Unless you are a clone of me, Dan, you're gonna see things differently to me. That's human nature. That's the way human beings are. Yes, I'm aware of that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I wasn't saying it for that purpose, but uh, yeah, I, I do understand. <laughs> we, you can understand we call on plenty of people. <laughs> I can understand what? What? understand we call on plenty of people and hear different points of view. Yeah, sure. And, and, and not everyone is going to be exactly the same as you. You're not going to knock on a door and a person says, I've never been a Jehovah's Witness, but 
every single thing that you say, they totally agree with everything. No. no. That would be a bit odd, wouldn't it? Yes, but we do, in, in our physics, we do assess um, uh, whether somebody is interested to learn uh, the truth from the Bible. Um, so what, what do you believe then about um, your questions about from Revelation? about the UN and the... Um, okay. The, All right, well, I'll, I'll give you my opinion, but I do note you're not answering any questions, but um, uh, you want me to start on 1919? Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to know why you selected... I'm more interested in why you selected that one, really. Um, well... 1919, you have to start with 1914. Um, yes. And 1914, you have to go back to 1844, William Miller's prophecy. You know the Great Disappointment? Are you familiar with that? 1844? No. 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 Well, you should, um, because it, it all comes from William Miller, who was what's called an Adventist. And the great disappointment, which was his prophecy that Christ would, the second coming of Christ would happen in 1843. When that didn't happen, he recalculated and he said, no, Christ is coming back in 1844. And millions and millions and millions of people around America and Europe became Adventists. They believed Christ was going to come back in 1844 and it didn't happen. Um, a woman called Ellen G. White founded the Seventh-day Adventists, which is one of many Adventist groups. And she said, ah, something did happen in 1844. There was investigative judgment. There was this investigation by Jesus Christ in heaven. It's all invisible, so you can't see it. You can't check it out. But Jesus went to heaven and he did investigative judgment. And he, he sort of made a sort of selection in heaven. And he, he, he applied his atonement what he did on the tree in 1844 in, in heaven, and that's called investigative judgment. Um, the 1844 date, as far as I know, because you see, in life you learn by talking to people. You, you, you know, you learn more by talking to different people. And I, I'm dead against sitting in a pew and just clapping away in a lot of Jesus and singing all the Jesus songs because Unfortunately, in my life, what I found is you don't learn anything doing that. But you do learn talking to people. 1844 comes from a guy called John Aquila Brown. And a, a book whose name I forget, in 1823 it was published. He prophesied for the first time in human history that the 1,520 days that were prophesied in Scripture are in fact years so if you start in the Old Testament, you take 2,520 years, you come up with a certain date. And William Miller took that and he came up with 1843 and then 1844. Now, as I understand it, Pastor Russell built on William Miller's 1844 date, but he extended it by 30 years to 1874. And that, remember, was based on John Aquila Brown's interpretation that the 2,520 days are in fact 2,520 years. So by extending 1844 by 30 years, you come to Russell's claim that the second presence of Christ was 1874. Christ was then crowned king in 1878 and Armageddon was going to happen in 1914. Um, I've got um, a watchtower from, is it, I think, 1892 and 1894. I can't remember the page numbers and the references, but I've got watchtowers from those, those two years that say, you know, there's no doubt whatsoever. The dates cannot be confused. 1914 is the end of the time of trouble. So to, to recap, Russell took William Miller's 1844 date, but extended it by 30 years. So he, he used, as William Miller did, the 2,520 years, but he had a different starting place, so it finished in 1874. 
when Armageddon didn't happen in 1914, eventually in 1930 or round about then, the dates were all moved up to 1914. So the second presence of Christ was no longer 1874, it was moved to 1914. I've got a book called Prophecy, uh, and on page 20, uh, 65 of Prophecy, published in 1929, is a really interesting book by Judge Rutherford. Um, he says, there is, there is no doubt whatsoever, the scriptural evidence is that the second presence of Christ dates from 1874. So as late as 1929, they were teaching the second presence of Christ from 1874. Now, what I'm trying to do is to work out how you get to 1919. And I don't know if I've got it right, because it is very confusing. And you don't seem to know too much about it yourself, but it's, it, is, it is difficult. But what I think happened was, once you establish that um, October 1914 was the date for the Battle of Armageddon, later to become the date for the second presence of Christ. You then use 42 months to count forward to 1918 when the eight Watchtower officers were arrested. Now here I've got a problem because I think that date of 42 months starts in December, or it, or it starts now in December 1914, not in October 1914. I think that gets you to June 1918 and that's taken literally that 42 months. Then I think there's three and a half days which gets you from June 19, 1918, sorry, not 1914, June 1918 to M March 1919. It's a period of nine months. So the 42 months is taken literally, but the three and a half days is taken spiritually, not as three and a half days, but it, it to represent nine months. So 42 months from possibly December 2000, uh, uh, December 1914 to June 1918, that's literal. Then you take the three and a half days, which is spiritually meant to represent nine months, total period of 51 months that gets you to March 1919 when the Watchtower officers were released from prison and I think this book Revelation is Grand Climax at Hand I've been looking round about page well 160 to 184 I think what it's saying is that is when they claim that Jesus was Jesus chose the Watchtower Society to be his sole representative on earth I think um, then you have another period of 1,260 days or 42 months. And that's from March 1919, when Jesus chose them or supposedly chose the Watchtower Society to the Cedar Point Convention in 1922, which is the first of the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation. And I think that's fairly clear from page, I think it's 167. Oh, uh, no, 173. Uh, yeah, 173 of this book talks about Jehovah's trumpet like judgment proclamations, and it starts in 1922 at Cedar Point, Ohio. And the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation is the convention at Detroit, Michigan in 1928. Um, so that's one thing I'm trying to work out how how you get this 1919 date because it's clearly important um, because the claim is that Jesus chose the Watchtower Society to be his sole representative in 1919 just as many other groups have made similar claims I mean the Mormons claim that in 1930 um, Jesus Christ chose them to be his sole representative and uh, the Christadelphians claim that uh, in about these 1860s or the 1870s Jesus chose them and them alone to be his sole representative on earth. Um, Victor Paul Verwell of the Way International claimed that in the 1950s, God chose his group, the Way International, to be his sole representative on earth. So there's many groups who claim that they and they alone are God's sole representative. 
um, Jehovah's Witnesses is just one of those groups. And I'm just trying to figure out why you claim this. And um, do, do you think they're wrong? Well, I, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. So obviously, I don't subscribe to this belief at all. No, just as I'm not a Mormon, I don't believe that God chose the Mormon church to be his sole representative in 1930. And I don't believe that God chose the Christadelphians to be his sole representative in the 1860s. And I don't claim that um, Jesus chose the, the Way International group to be his sole represent, representative in the 1950s. Um, but if, if you can show me, I, I mean, one thing I would like to see is what evidence is there that Jesus chose the Watchtower Society in 1919? Do you have any evidence for that, Daniel? I don't believe God, God has an organization. I don't believe he's ever had an organization or a, let me be Pacific, a corporation, because the Watchtower Society is actually a business. It's actually an incorporated business incorporated yeah. in the state of Pennsylvania in December 1884. And it's a yeah. corporation that issues shares. It has shareholders. I don't believe that God chose a corporation to represent him in 1919. But if I'm if I'm wrong, I'd be really interested to know you know, what I'm missing or what evidence you have for this, because there's, there's really nothing in this revelation book. It makes all these claims, but it doesn't substantiate any of these claims with any evidence whatsoever. I mean, you know, anyone can stand up and say, well, we had seven district conventions in the 1920s, and they are the seven trumpets prophesied in the book of Revelation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just just saying that doesn't constitute proof or evidence, does it? Yeah. So, so you, so is God using anybody today? Who is he? In the past, he's used. Uh, he had a people for his name. So, is he using anybody today? Well, I think that if you look at Colossians one thirteen, it uses a past tense, and uh, it says that. Um, oh, it's talking about a kingdom, because I think that's what Christ is actually building. He's actually building a kingdom. And this kingdom is not buildings and organizations with a pyramidal structure, because all of these religious groups are all the same, whether it's the Baptists or the Mormons or uh, Scientology or Christadelphians. They're all a sort of pyramid like structure with one guy at the top, uh, one leader at the top who can't be challenged. And people like me at the bottom are supposed to sort of do as we're told. But what Christ has been doing since his death, burial and his resurrection is he's been building a kingdom and that kingdom is people who love him and who obey him and which I certainly uh, seek to be a part of. And it's written in the past tense, which meant that when Colossians was written by Paul in the in the 50s, the early 50s, about AD 50 to AD 55, because it's aorist, which means a completed action in Greek, past tense in English, the kingdom of God was already established and being added to. Um, I'll read it to you, King James, Colossians 1.13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Um, I think the modern versions read who has translated us from the power of darkness and has, past tense, translated us into the kingdom of the son of his dear love. So the kingdom of God was already established. So I don't think God has any interest at all in corporations or organisations or church buildings, or church denominations, or buildings made of stone. He hasn't any interest at all. In, 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 in Acts 17, it says God does not dwell in buildings made with stones, but he dwells within his people. Those people who are in the New Covenant, I think it's 1 Corinthians 6 somewhere towards the end of that chapter. I don't have my normal Bible with me. I've just moved house. And I'm still in this process of unpacking, so I'm using a a Bible I'm not very familiar with, but uh, which, which translation do you? Use? Well, my my Bible with my notes would be the New King James Bible. Uh, this is a King James, but I I also use the New American Standard and the ESV. Uh, yeah, this is one Corinthians six nineteen. What 
Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So it says there that the Holy Spirit indwells his people. John 14, 23 talks about the Father and the Son indwelling his people, which proves omnipresence, because how can the Father and the Son indwell millions of people around the world if they're not omnipresent so far the son and the holy spirit indwell his people proving omnipresence and so god dwells within his temple which are the bodies of those people who are his who are in the new covenant um, he doesn't dwell in buildings made with stone so i don't think god has any interest at all in organizations or corporations or buildings made of stone or some pyramidal structure with the pastor at the top who you know, if it's a Pentecostal, he, he, some of these Pentecostal preachers on TV, they fly around the world in jets. They've got Rolls Royces and Ferraris and they fly around the world in jets. I don't think God has any interest in that whatsoever. He's not interested in building up that business or that corporation or that organization. He dwells in his people. Uh, and those people are his temple, not some building made of stone. And the kingdom of God is what he is building and what those people who love him are supposed to be doing, be about his business, the business of building the tent, the kingdom of God, which means the kingdom of God means the rule of God, bringing all people under the authority of Christ and telling them to obey Christ because there's a judgment coming. One day we're all going to die and we'll stand before God at the judgment. And there's a judgment coming. And we should be about in our lives doing things that honour and please uh, Christ because he is the one who's going to be judging those people. There'll be two judgments. There'll be the judgment of believers works for those people who are in covenant relationship with him. Um, it won't be a judgment of their sins because their sins are forgiven. So they'll never be judged. But believers works the works that they've done and then there'll be a second judgment for those people who aren't in covenant relationship with christ and those people will be judged for the sins that they have committed and they will be punished eternally for those sins that they have committed but i mean colossians 1 13 is very very clear who has translate delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son so the kingdom of his son that's what we are to be about we proclaim the rule of Christ. Christ said, Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Christ has all authority. He is the king of the kingdom. And because he's the king of the kingdom, we're to proclaim that kingdom rule to the peoples of the world. That's the message of Matthew 28, 19 and 20. You know, go ye and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 20. That's proclaiming the kingdom, the rule of God, the rule of Christ to rule over the whole world. And although Christ is currently ruling in the midst of his enemies, that's Psalm 110 too, there's going to come a day when Satan is put down. That's the Battle of Armageddon. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And when Satan is put down, then the kingdom will be fully established. Because although the kingdom was established at Christ's resurrection and it's been the kingdom has been built for 2000 years, Christ is currently ruling in the midst of his enemies. So Satan is trying to attack God's people and to attack God's Christ, Christ, Christ kingdom. So um, that will that will stop that rebellion of satan will, will stop at armageddon does does that explain my position daniel have i explained it adequately that's fine and um, uh, the um, message of the kingdom rule by christ is spreading that message is the purpose of my life as well right we, we, we agree on that one okay <laughs> okay um I think I mentioned the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation. I did find that uh, a little bit strange. Um, I'm looking at page 172 now, paragraph five 
of the Revelation book. The trumpet blast of the seventh angel was reflected in the highlights of the Bible Students Convention in Detroit, Michigan, July 30th to August the 6th, 1928. And it goes on to talk about this in more detail. Um, so the second thing is I find it a bit strange that something in the book of Revelation that I would see as still future, the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation, um, I don't think they've happened yet, and I certainly don't believe they happened in the 1920s. Um, I found that a little bit strange, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if there's any evidence for that. Do you, do you have any evidence for that? Well, I, I purposefully didn't research any of the questions because I was more interested in um, discussing a broader what your views were on scripture and God. And, and it's been quite enlightening, really, to see um, where, where you're coming from, really, because I, I can see why you ask those technical questions. I can see that by where you're coming from. Yeah, you've obviously uh, have a very strong view on these things and have researched it a lot. You've, yeah, some, of, some of these things you, re you research far more than I have. To, and I can see why you you don't believe them and you, you, um, yeah, you don't believe them. And yeah. The, the... I, I, I don't, do you want to, is your purpose to convince me that I'm wrong? I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if, um, what, what you wanted me, Robert? I, I... Well, I was actually hoping for some sort of evidence or proof for these claims in the Revelation book. I mean, if you don't want to discuss it, obviously I have to respect your wishes if you don't wish to discuss it, Daniel. Um, believe me, the, the two things I've studied far more than this would be, the, firstly, the doctrine of the Trinity. It was the doctrine of the Trinity that got me out of the evangelical church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because what tends to happen in many churches... Not in every church, but I've seen it in Pentecostal churches and in Reformed churches constantly. Um, you tend to find that the, there's a one man band pastor who's in charge. I think that's unbiblical. I, I think if you look at the book of Acts, Acts 14, 23 says Paul appointed elders, plural, in every city. So churches, I think, were run by a plurality of elder, never by a one man band pastor. Um, but what you no. tend to find in many evangelical churches is you've got dad who's the pastor and he appoints his son or if it's a pentecostal church sometimes his daughter or his wife as the associate pastor or as the co-pastor right. it's quite incredible so obviously if you go into a church as has happened to me many times um and for instance i'll give you an example i i was been told repeatedly Jesus is God the Father and you look on the church website and the church website claims to be Trinitarian and it denies the claim that Jesus is God the Father on the church website yeah. right so when you then tell the pastor that he turns on you and the submissive beta male elders the weak little elders who are just yes men who do what does what the pastor says they all turn on me also because the pastor has to support his family no matter what. It doesn't matter what the pastor's wife or the pastor's daughter or the pastor's son has said. It could well be that they did say to me, Jesus is God the Father or some other similar heretical thing. I remember I was told that there was actually two atonements once in a Pentecostal church, Plymouth Christian Centre. There was an atonement on the cross and then Jesus went to hell and made the second atonement, a spiritual atonement to the hell in in hell to the devil now actually it wasn't the pastor's son or daughter who said that uh, it was actually members of uh, god tv who were attending plymouth christian center but here's the thing when you're told this in an evangelical church the pastor has to support his own family member who said that even though it's against the church doctrinal statement of faith because it's just a family business, mate. It's all about making money and having status for one family within the fellowship who are elevated above everyone else. 
So do you do you understand my quandary? Uh, I can see yeah. you've, you've done, done, a, done um, a great search. <laughs> yeah, if, if the church teaches the Trinity, and that's on the website, Billy Bob Joe Pastor's assistant, or Billy Bob Joe Elder, doesn't have a clue what the Trinity is. He just makes it up as he goes along. And because he's talking to people who are biblically illiterate, he can get away with statements like Jesus is God the Father, or crazy statements like that Jesus made two atonements, one on the cross, and he made a second atonement in hell to the devil, a spiritual atonement in hell, which is actually a heresy known as JDS. And he can get away with that because he's speaking to dumb, ignorant people who don't know the Bible and couldn't care less. If I come along into that church, I immediately detect that what he has said, that Jesus is God the Father, is not actually Trinitarian at all. When I point that out very politely and very respectfully, often to a man half my age, as has happened before, uh, the last time it happened, it was with a man half my age. I'm nearly 60. Now, the Bible does say that younger men are supposed to show respect to older men. Especially older men like me who've studied the Trinity for 20 years and know what I'm talking about. But what tends to happen is when the pastor's son or the pastor's daughter makes a crazy statement and says Jesus is God the Father or any number of similar crazy anti-biblical statements like that. They know that their dad, the pastor, will support them to the death. And they would do everything they can to dismiss, to discredit, or even to throw out of the building, even to call the police and get someone like me escorted from the building. Because <laughs> that's how the church system operates as a business. So I've studied the Trinity for 30 years. The second thing I've studied is tithing. Tithing is an absolutely fascinating topic. And if you ever have anything to do with the evangelical church in any way whatsoever, even if you're a Jehovah's Witness speaking to them at the carts, the number one doctrine to learn is not the Trinity, it's tithing. Because tithing is taking over the evangelical church. It's becoming an obsession in certain churches, particularly Pentecostal and charismatic churches uh, here in the south southwest of England. So... Um, that's one that I've studied for 10 years, and um, that's truly fascinating. Um, but I won't talk about that, because if I talk about that, I'll be here for hours. Um, but that's some... Um, the, 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 the final thing, if you don't want to respond to this, uh, I'll just mention that page 254, I notice that it mentions the United Nations, and it calls them the scarlet-coloured wild beast. Um, it basically says the United Nations is basically satanic and it's one of the wild beasts of the book of Revelations. Um, that's page 254. I think it actually starts 250. Yeah, it actually starts 251 ex executing Babylon the Great. And it says Babylon the Great is basically the United Nations or the UN United Nations would be part of uh, Babylon the Great. Um, but the Jehovah's Witness religion actually joined the UN for nine years, from 1992 to 2001. I remember reading about this in The Guardian, because it was The Guardian newspaper that exposed the Jehovah's Witnesses UN membership in 2001. And I remember reading about this. I was quite, quite shocked. Um, the UN and the Jehovah's Witness religion have both issued press statements admitting to their membership of the UN for nine years. Um, um, the UN are quite exasperated about it because tens of thousands of people have written to them around the world about this and they got fed up <laughs> um, answering so many questions about this. The explanation from the Watchtower Society is dishonest because they said they joined to get a, a library card, um, which is not actually true because um, what the Jehovah's Witnesses were was they took out NGO membership. Do you know what an NGO is? NGO? Uh, no. No, NGO stands for non-governmental organisation. 
it basically means if 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 you have representatives that go to some African or Asian country and they have UN membership as an NGO, they're treated rather like an ambassador. They, they, they have favorable treatment by that government. The governments can't simply arrest those people and put them in prison, for instance. Just just as if um, if if the British government sends an ambassador to Russia. The Russians can tell that ambassador, we don't like you anymore, go back to Britain. But they can't throw that ambassador in Britain because he has diplomatic immunity. Well, I'm not saying that NGO membership is diplomatic immunity. It's not that extreme, but they have a lot of favorable treatment. And there's certain ways that N uh, NGOs have to be treated by various governments. So for various political reasons, um, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society were members of the UN for nine years. When it was exposed by The Guardian, they left the very next day. There's been a big hoo-ha in the press about this. Um, numerous newspapers talked about this at the time, and the BBC also talked about this. Um, interestingly, part of the NGO membership was that the Watchtower had to publish at least one article in their magazines a year which were favourable to the UN. So if you do a, a search, because I've gone to JW.org, I've done a search, and I think I found 12 articles uh, all of which are favourable to the UN, saying what a wonderful organisation the UN is and what a great work it does. Mostly in the Awake magazine, one was in the Watchtower, but most are in the Awake, uh, between 1992 and 2001. So the interesting thing is that in the more heavy literature, like Revelation, its grand climax at hand, you say the UN is satanic, it's the eighth scarlet colored eighth beast of the book of revelation and, and, and it's of the devil but between 1992 and 2001 in the awake magazine and you need to do the work you need to go to jw.org and do a search for all the articles about the un and you will read groveling articles mostly in the awake that literally grovel saying what a great organization the un is and they were obliged to publish those articles because that was the condition of un membership um, when they left in 2001, people thought that they severed all ties with the UN, but actually they're still connected with the UN today. Um, not through the main um, Watchtower head office in, in Warwick, New York, but through European subsidiaries. Um, there are subsidiaries, because the Watchtower isn't just one business organization or corporation it's actually over a hundred it's very very complicated um, lots of multinational companies do the same thing they'll actually divest their power and their money into a hundred or hundreds of different corporations so they can avoid paying tax the the although they're not officially members of the un as of today or certainly as of recently they they are members of what's called the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is a UN subsidiary. But the Watchtower corporations that are members of that are, um, are working from memory here. I think it's the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in Europe. I think that's the name of the Watchtower subsidiary corporation. So it's not the main corporation, it's a subsidiary Watchtower corporation. Um, the reason for it is that um, what the Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to do is use OSCE, which is a, an offshoot of the UN, uh, which has, well, it, it, it has UN affiliations. OSCE, they're trying to use it to help the Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia who, who are facing persecution from the Russian state. And what they're also trying to do through OSCE, together with other religious groups like the Scientologists and various militant homosexual groups, is they're trying to extend the hate laws in Europe and make any form of disagreement a hate crime. So for instance, um, if the police were monitoring this telephone call if the Jehovah's Witnesses have their way through the OSCE, I could be arrested because I've disagreed with you. And that is what they want to do is to get 
any form of disagreement labelled as a hate crime, which is deserving of an imprisoned sentence. Um, so they're members of the OSCE. OSCE has UN affiliations. It's to recap, it's not the main watchdog corporation that's a member of OSCE, Organisation Security and Cooperation in Europe. It's uh, subsidiary European corporations of the Watchtower Bible and Track Society. They're doing this to try and help the Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia who are being persecuted by the Russian state. But at the same hand, they're trying to use OSCE to do to other religious people, such as myself, for instance, uh, exactly what the Russian state is doing to Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia. Scientologists, Jehovah's Witnesses and gay homosexual groups are trying to say, if you disagree with us, that disagreement is going to be labelled as a hate crime and you will be imprisoned on the basis of committing a hate crime. Um, I don't think they're going to be successful in that, but that's what the Scientologists and Jehovah's Witnesses are, are fighting hard to do. An OSCE is an organisation made up of parliamentary members of, I think it's over 50 countries, various parliamentarians in various parliaments all over Europe. They become members of OSCE for a year and they try to further the aims of OSCE, which which seems to be um, facilitating business and really advancing political correctness, Bas basically making sure that everyone doesn't discuss and disagree with other people, because if you disagree with other people, um, they want to really move in the direction of seeing any form of disagreement as a hate crime, particularly um, disagreement with Muslims, of course. If you disagree with Islam, um, they, they want to sort of move in the direction of saying people who disagree with Islam are bigots and, you know, they're committing some sort of crime. So the third and final question was, seeing that you're so much against the UN that you see the UN as a satanic scarlet coloured beast from the book of Revelation and on page 254 of the Revelation book. Why did you join the UN from 1992 to 2001? I, I can see that you, you're very, um, you have a very strong view on that. So, yeah, that's fine. But it's, it's not a case of a strong view, it's the facts. The yeah, facts exactly. are the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has issued a press release stating that, yes, we were, we were members of the UN, but they lie in that press release saying that we were members of the UN in order to get a library pass for one of our researchers. In order to, get, to gain entrance to the UN library, we took out a library pass. The UN has said we're basically we're fed up with thousands and thousands of people across the world writing to us about the JW's UN membership. They were members of the UN uh, from two, uh, 1992 to 2001. They resigned the day after the Guardian article was published. You don't need a library pass to use our UN libraries. So the Jehovah's Witness organization is lying. And secondly, why did the um, Jehovah's Witness religion, usually in the awake, but once in the Watchtower magazine, um, comply with the UN regulation to produce groveling articles which promoted the UN as a good thing, saying what a great work the UN is doing. There was, there was a wake after a wake after a wake. The, the UN regulations for NGO membership said that they had to produce one of these groveling articles a year and, and if, you, if you do a search under a wake, you'll find that's exactly what they did. They were practically kissing the boots of the UN, saying what a great organisation they are and what a great job they do. Um, and the UN has the year of, I mean, they have various years where they focus on various things, like the year of the child, um, the year for better health, or the year for the older person. And if you look at the Watchtower articles, that groveling, grovelingly supported the UN, they were bringing out the UN's yearly aim at the same time. So when the UN had the year of the child, the Awake article would support the great work the UN was doing with children. And these articles were literally practically kissing the feet of the UN, groveling, saying how wonderful the UN was. But the strange thing was, at the same time that they were publishing these articles, 
in the heavier literature like the Revelation, its grand climax and handbook, your official position was that the UNs of the devil is the scarlet coloured beast of the book of Revelation. I, I, I can't reconcile that. It's not my opinion, mate. It's a fact. It's a fact that you were members of the UN and it's a fact that you produced 12, about 12 articles practically groveling in the, your support of the UN, whilst at the same time, officially, the watchtower position was that the UN is the satanic wild beast of the book of Revelation. Okay. Are all the members of Falmouth Kingdom Hall as talkative as you? <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> I, I can see you're of a... No, perhaps, you, perhaps others would say more than me. I can see you're quite set on your view, so that I'll... Yeah, that's fine, I'll leave you with that. Well, do, do you have anything to say then, to, to add or to ask me as a question before we go? Well, I've asked quite a few questions and I've, I've learnt a lot, because that, that's what I wanted to do, to, to understand where you were coming from. Yeah. I, yeah. do, I do understand where you're coming from, so, so that's that's satisfied me. I'm quite clear what your purpose and meaning is. What, what is what, what what is what is that? I think it's quite evident. So, I'm, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to understand what uh, your purpose is. OK, well, look, it's been lovely speaking to you, Daniel. If you want to speak again, um, I'm quite happy yeah. to speak to you again. All I ask is just send me a text in advance because I'm... Yeah. yeah. Nice, to, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Daniel. And thank you very much for your time and your patience yeah. with me. All right. Thanks, Robert. OK. Yeah. Bye then. Bye. Bye.